I'm Abhay Bhave. I'm a hematologist from Mumbai. We are going to discuss the management of transplant ineligible patients with multiple myeloma. When you look at this group of patients, basically you are looking at an aim of treatment which is disease control with the least possible toxicity. In that, we have to appreciate what the comorbidities of the patient are because this will help us to individualize therapy for every patient. I think one of the most important things is to counsel the patient and the caregiver of the benefits and side effects of treatment. In our country, the moment cancer has been mentioned, there is a change in mindset. And that's what we have to actually reset in our patients. When we talk of ineligibility, what do we actually mean? We mean that patients are above the age of 65 probably, but more importantly, they are frail. So frailty is a big issue towards inability for a transplant. They may have comorbidities such as renal, blood pressure, diabetes or pulmonary dysfunction. These may actually add on to the inability to take a transplant. And then there are those patients who have read and they have a personal preference after counselling and their reading not to go for a transplant, which I think we'll have to respect. And then finally, those are the ones who have a financial inability to go for a transplant. For the sake of this discussion, we are going to take those which are scientifically ineligible. At the time of diagnosis in this cohort of patients, 50% of the transplant patients, ineligible patients, have a creatinine clearance which is less than 60 ml per minute. And this is a very major feature which may influence our treatment decision. Almost one third to 50% of our patients in this age group present with stage 3 disease as per the ISS classification, making them difficult candidates for a standard of care treatment. But in a recent study, this ISS staging and cytogenetics were not as important as frailty. And we're going to discuss more of this aspect. So what's frailty? There was a score which was um, carried out and developed on the basis of certain uh, values. And what did we find? That the frailer the patient, the lesser is the overall survival and the progression-free survival as compared to a fit patient. And this was more important than the ISS stage of cytogenetics. We must all remember that the old, elderly, and the frail patients have not been included in many trials that are conducted on the newer drugs. Therefore, we don't even know how they'll behave. Having said all this, I think thalidomide, lenalidomide, and bortezomib have changed the way we treat multiple myeloma, not only for those who are transplant, but also transplant ineligible. They're responsible for having improved the rate of CR, complete remission, progression-free survival, and overall survival, and the time taken to the next treatment. But at the same time, we have to remind them that this is an incurable disease and that many of these treatments have certain side effects which they have to probably take during this treatment. If you look at this algorithm which is in front of you, this includes both eligible and non-eligible. The one which is on the left-hand side of the screen is that for eligible patients. The one which is on the right side is what we are going to discuss. There are two options in front of me. One, the first option, is where the backbone of treatment is melphalan prednisolone the age-old understood Alexanian protocol. To that, we've added two new drugs, either bortezomib or thalidomide. You'll see in between them, there is one which is a doublet. It's called RD, that is lenalidomide with dexamethasone, and we'll discuss these. Now, for those patients who have not yet made up their mind, whether they want a transplant or not, and therefore, at present, they are transplant ineligible, we should avoid melphalan. Therefore, the second option is very attractive, where the backbone seems to be dexamethasone and bortezomib with the addition of either cyclophosphamide or thalidomide. Here also there is one doublet, which is bortezomib with dexamethasone. We have to be prudent as to which combination to use for which patient based on the sensibilities and the discussions we've had. If the patient truly is not a candidate for transplant, then the first option seems to be very good. But if they are still not clear, then the second option could be used till the time it's very clear in the patient's mind. Both these two options involve injectables, that means coming to hospital. Therefore, the third option is also attractive for those really elderly patients or patients who are staying far away from your, standard, from your place of care to only take the oral medications. And CTD is one of them. We'll be discussing that. Usually, whichever protocol has been used in any of these options, we wait for about two to four therapies to reassess the patient's clinical situation. There are standard ways of monitoring whether the patient is doing well 
by certain parameters which are biochemical and radiological. Now, if you look at those patients who have had a transplant, they received melphalan and then they had some form of consolidation. We are discussing patients who are ineligible, therefore this option does not exist for us. We also know from the transplant patient that there is some form of maintenance therapy which is needed. So is there a need for maintenance therapy in those who are ineligible? Does it make sense and is there data? And I am now happy to present the data which is on the maintenance therapy in patients who are responsive for the ineligible group of patients. There are some points I would like you to ponder on. Both the MPT and VMP are probably one of the best protocols that can be used in this cohort of patients. And they have clearly shown that the addition of either of the novel agents to the MP back base helps to improve the progression-free survival and overall survival. I think CTD is a very good option, which is cyclophosphamide, thalidomide and dexamethasone is a very good option for patients who want only oral therapy and cannot take injectables. And this has been used quite often in the United Kingdom. I think that's a good option in India too. If you are going to use bortezomib for those who have not yet made up their mind, then we have moved from twice a week initial to weekly and from intravenous to subcutaneous. This made the travel of our patients to our clinic lesser and it also reduced the amount of morbidity that is neuropathy and diarrhea by going to the subcutaneous form. However, may I just say that for those patients who have a renal dysfunction and extensive bone disease, it's best to continue twice a week of the bortezomib. Adding thalidomide to the bortezomib and DEXA really hasn't made too much difference. And in my experience, adding thalidomide to bortezomib has actually yielded more neuropathy, which has affected the quality of life of my patient. Like I said, simple bendamustin with prednisolone or the oral combination of CTD, cyclophosphamide, thalidomide, DEXA is a good option in our Indian scenario. Many of our patients have exhibited the desire that they want to continue some form of treatment. So that's called continuous therapy. And I'm going to present something to you on continuous therapy and its benefit, at least in terms of lenalidomide, which has now been accepted and just got approval this February 2017 for continuous use post-transplant in those who have undergone an autologous stem cell transplantation. Now we come to one combination which is called MPR. This is the melphalan, prednisolone and lenalidomide combination. While it is an excellent combination, I have a worry about this. The ability of the elderly patients to handle this is difficult. Number two, it causes significant cytopenias. And number three, the combination of len and melphalan may be associated with some form of a secondary malignancy at a later date. And hence, this combination, while brilliant, is not very often used. 